Hello everyone and welcome to Catholic Truth. In this video we are going to be debunking the supposed list of Catholic inventions. You know the famous list that goes around the internet where it says the Catholic Church invented this and this year and this and this year and this and this year. All of them are wrong. <laughs> Literally. Here's the meme just so you can see which one I'm talking about and which ones we're going to be discussing in this video. But this meme unfortunately is the most knowledge and research that many anti-Catholics put into things. Like literally, they just see memes like this, they commit these things to memory, or they just share them with other people without actually fact-checking whether the meme is true or not in the first place, whether it's correct or not, whether it has misinformation. And many times they just don't care. But as we're going to see in this video, these things aren't true. So people who share these memes and hate the Catholic Church and say that the Pope invents all of these things and disregards the Word of God, all of these things people need to realize aren't true in the first place. These arguments that they make, most of them are not even true in the first place. And we don't have time to get to them all in this video, but we're going to do like half of them in this video, then we'll make a part two for the rest of them. So let's get going. The first one on the list says the Catholic Church invented adoration of Mary in 375 AD, where we worship and adore her as God. Really? Huh. I would love to see a source on that. And you got to wonder why they just randomly picked 375, because it doesn't make any sense. First of all, adoration is for God only. That is divine worship. That's for God only. That has always been the teaching of the Catholic Church. Second of all, there's sometimes confusion because the word worship and honor and respect have been always used interchangeably throughout history. Even in the Bible, outside the Bible, people use worship and honor, respect interchangeably. And in fact, to, to prevent that confusion, it was the Catholic Church that distinguished two different terms, latria and dulia, both Latin terms. One means adoration and the other means veneration. Adoration is for God only. It's worship of God only, only divinity. And veneration is respect and honor for the things of God, like the saints, the angels, that sort of thing. Now, unless you're completely dishonest, like uh, James White and people like him who don't care about facts and just like to be right, he loves to say, oh, veneration and adoration, worship, they're all the same thing for the Catholic Church. He's just being dishonest, but we'll do a whole nother video on him. The fact is, they've been used interchangeably throughout history, and that's why you'll hear people in certain countries, maybe even like England, talk to a judge. They'll call him your honor, or they'll even call him your worship. Like, they still do that today sometimes. Your honor, your worship. It means the same thing. It's just honor. It's not actual worship. Worship means honor in that regard. So, it was the Catholic Church that sorted out that confusion, that said, no, Adoration is just for God. Veneration is for other people. So it's the Catholic Church that taught that adoration is for only for God. So this meme that says adoration is for Mary is 100% false. If you don't believe me, we'll put uh, this quote up on the screen here. It comes from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 296, and it says this. Adoration is the acknowledgement of God as God, creator and savior, the Lord and master of everything that exists as infinite and merciful love. Notice, nothing about Mary being adored there. <laughs> when we go to adoration, that's what Catholic, I actually said that to somebody once. I said, oh, me and my friend are going to adoration. And the person looked at me confused and they said, of Mary? And I said, <laughs> I, I, I de don't think I laughed, but I almost did. And I said, no, of Jesus. You know, and so they didn't understand that. But no, adoration is for Jesus. Here, check this out as well. The word used to express those acts of divine worship, which are directed to God only, and of which the characteristics are recognition of his perfection and omnipotence and our own complete dependence on him him. And that comes from a Catholic dictionary. Not just a Catholic dictionary, but a Catholic dictionary. That's the name of it. <laughs> and it says that worship, divine worship, adoration, is directed to God only and shows our dependence on 
him. Likewise, the Catholic Encyclopedia says this. It kind of parcels out a little bit more of what I was saying. It says, Latria or Lateria, of course, it's a, a Latin term, is a theological term, Latin, Latria, from the Greek, and it's used in Catholic theology to mean adoration, a reverence directed only to the Holy Trinity. And of course, that goes on to talk about veneration in the other passages below that, which says those are only directed toward Mary and the saints. Like Mary, when we honor her, why? Because she's blessed for all ages, as it says in Luke 1, 48. You, all generations will call me blessed. So we bless her, we honor her, but we only worship God. We only adore God. We, we give our lives to God because only he's God. Mary's only a creature. She's nothing without God. She's an ant compared to God, literally. Anything that she has was given to her and is a grace by God. So do we adore Mary? Absolutely not. Do we adore God? Absolutely. The second one is equally wrong. It says the adoption of the Mass came about in 395 AD. Again, where are they getting these? I have no idea because the Mass goes back to the first century. It goes back to Christ. And in fact, it goes back for centuries before 395 AD. I mean, one only has to look at Justin Martyr, who was a Catholic apologist in the second century. And he was writing to the Roman emperor in around the year 150, 151, because there were a lot of rumors, some false rumors going around about Christians. And he wanted to clarify to the emperor what Christians do and how they worship before God. And he says they gather together with a band and they do praise and worship. Oh, wait, no, sorry. This is 1,600, 1500 years before Protestant. <clears throat> Oh, no, sorry. This is about 1,400 years before Protestantism. No, but in all seriousness, he talks about the Mass. He talks about the Eucharist. He talks about the Eucharistic sacrifice. He talks about how Catholics say the prayers for the first part of the Mass, and then they go into the sign of peace, which we still have. Then we go into the Holy Eucharist, which no one is allowed to partake of unless they are first baptized. And when he talks about the Eucharist, he also talks about when it's mixed, it's, it's mixed with uh, flour and water, the same way that Catholics and Orthodox do today. The only two churches that I know of that, that follow what Justin Martyr is talking about in regard to Holy Communion, the breaking of the bread, is Catholic and Orthodox, showing that this goes back centuries before 395 AD. And of course, he says, after the Eucharist, we leave and we bring Holy Communion to those who are not able to get to Mass and partake of it, literally, which is what we still do today. And I ask you all to forgive my voice out there because I'm getting major, major allergies. So it's <laughs> affecting my voice a lot. Um, but the bottom line is we still take communion to people today. And that has been going on for before 150 AD. He's just talking about what Christians already do. I mean, this was going on long before that. And we've been doing it over 1900 years. Like, that's so cool. So was the Catholic Mass invented in 395? Absolutely not. It went back far before 395. The next uh, one on the list says that Mary was made a deity in 432 to replace the Roman mother goddess. <laughs> yes, people, that's what the Catholic Church did. They wanted to take the Roman goddess and put Mary there to be worshipped in her place. So they did not. <laughs> so here's the first thing you're going to notice about this meme and every meme like it. There's no citations. There's no sources, there's no facts, there's no evidence, there's no nothing. We're supposed to just take these people's word for it. I mean, literally their own opinion. Without facts, is just your opinion. Without evidence, it's just your opinion and no one cares about your opinion. So give us facts. If they were going to actually prove that the Catholic Church started this in uh, 432 AD, the first thing they would need to do is give a documentation of where the Pope said, okay, we are going to replace Mary. Or maybe a Catholic source saying, you know what, it's important that people worship Mary instead of the old pagan goddess. So we're going to do this, this, and this. And they show the sources. But if people say, oh, well, there are no sources, they did it secretly, then it's no more than a conspiracy theory. <laughs> Conspiracy theory of anti-Catholics, they are so abundant. They make up these lies, they make up these claims, these slanderous things. They don't fact check them, and then we're just supposed to 
accept them. We're just supposed to, oh yeah, it happened. No, there's, they don't offer any sources. And we know that it's not true because we just read sources that we're supposed to worship God alone. We're supposed to adore God alone. We're supposed to give our lives to God alone, not Mary. So we know that this is not true. There's literally nothing in Catholic theology about adoring Mary or giving her divine worship or replacing goddesses or anything like that. The only thing that comes close was, I believe it was in the late 300s, and there was a heresy where some women started to blend uh, worship of Mary with other pagan. It was kind of like a blending of religions. And off the top of my head, I believe that the heresy was called Coloridianism. And that was like the late fourth century. And guess who condemned that heresy? That's right, the Catholic Church, the Pope came out, well, this is the bishop first, but the bishop in the Catholic Church condemned that heresy of Coloridianism, of worshiping Mary, of putting too much emphasis on Mary to making, really making her a goddess. And they offered sacrifice to her and food. They made food to her and like kind of delivered them to her statues and things like that. And literally, the Catholic Church condemned this kind of rogue group for worshiping Mary. They were worshiping Mary as a goddess, and the Catholic Church condemned it as a heresy and put an end to it and said it could not be done. Why? Because we don't worship Mary. We've never worshipped Mary. We don't worship Mary now. And anyone who continues to say this, despite the facts, is either living a deluded life and you don't want to face the facts, or you don't want to do any research and you're not honest before God. Because what the facts say... And what anti-Catholics say are two different things. Now, at best, somebody could say, yes, but, you know, I lived in this country and I know that my mother worshipped Mary. Well, first of all, I doubt it. But let's just say that it's true. It doesn't mean that the Catholic Church's teachings are wrong. It just means that your mother is wrong. Your mother's taken it too far. She hasn't been properly educated in the faith. The Catholic Church's teachings are clear. Some people may abuse them, but that doesn't make the teachings wrong any more than it makes the Bible wrong. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, the Church of God, Seventh-day Adventists, many Protestants, they all misuse the Bible in many ways. I mean, just look at Jehovah's Witnesses. That doesn't mean the Bible's wrong. It just means they need to be more educated. It just means they need to have a deeper understanding of what it really means. We don't get rid of the Bible just because someone misuses it, and we don't just start slandering the Catholic Church because some people don't understand her teachings. The next one we're going to cover is purgatory, where the Catholic Church invented the doctrine of purgatory in 593. Too bad, it's a shame. It's a crying shame that St. Augustine was already talking about purgatory as one example in around the year 400. That's almost 200 years before this meme, which a lot of people use, claims that the Catholic Church invented purgatory. And if Augustine and other people were talking about purgatory and an afterlife where sins could be forgiven uh, by Christ, 200 years before it actually happened, then how, pray tell, was it invented in 593? It wasn't. And again, this meme is wrong. If you don't believe me, listen to what St. Augustine says in the year 411. I'm going to read this quote, which is a bit long, so I'll read it fast. But you're going to see that it talks about prayers for the dead. It talks about them being loose for their sins. It talks about the ecclesiastical discipline, meaning this is the church discipline in the year 411. That's almost 200 years before it claims to be invented. But listen to what St. Augustine says. There is an ecclesiastical discipline, as the faithful know, when the names of the martyrs are read aloud in the place at the altar of God, i.e. Mass, where prayer is not offered for them. So we don't pray for the martyrs because they're in heaven. Prayer, however, is offered for other dead who are remembered. It is wrong to pray for a martyr, to those who we ought to commend ourselves be commended. So just a second here. Notice he says around the year 400 that we shouldn't pray to martyrs because they're already in heaven. We should commend ourselves to their prayers. You know, he's already talking about the intercessory prayers of the saints at such a, a like a early time in the church. And yet non-Catholics 
especially anti-Catholics, love to try to make Augustine a Protestant. <laughs> they try to say, oh, he believed in faith alone. He believed in the Bible alone. He believed in this. He was a Protestant. No, he believes a Catholic. But that aside, let's continue. And this quote proves that, by the way. But by the prayers of the Holy Church and by the salvific sacrifice, i.e. of Christ, and by the alms which are given for their spirits, there is no doubt that the dead are aided, that the Lord might deal more mercifully with them in their sins than they would deserve. The whole church observes this practice, which was handed down by the fathers. Temporal punishments, i.e. purgatory, indulgences, all that sort of stuff, are suffered by some in this life only, by some after death, and by some both here and after death, but all of them before the last and strictest judgment. But not all who suffer temporal punishments after death will come to the eternal punishments, which are to follow after that judgment. So, St. Augustine, I mean, whether you agree with the quote or not, you say, oh, well, that's Augustine. I don't agree with that. Okay, it doesn't matter. The point is, it was almost 200 years before they said purgatory was invented, and this is just not true. This is why I've said it once, and I've said it a million times. I literally just said this in our last video on Seventh-day Adventists, and I literally just said this in our video on John MacArthur, which is coming out uh, Sunday in a few days. I literally said it. If you said it once, I've said it a million times, that you have to source check and fact check anti-Catholics. The more anti-Catholic they are, the less honest they are, the less they care about doing honest research, and the more they have these dubious quotes, these just ridiculous facts, these things that aren't true from beginning to end. You're going to see there's not a single thing that's actually true on this list. There's one that's partly true of the entire list, and the rest is just can be thrown in the trash. So why do we believe these things? And why are people so quick to believe, except that they want them to be true? That's when we lose the ability to critically think when we want something to be true, even when we know it's not, or it might not be. The only one on this list that's kind of partially could be maybe true is the saints. Saints were invented in 995 AD. Not really, but kind of. I mean... Not really. <laughs> I would say more no than yes. So they're saying, oh, saints came about in 995. Really? Then why were people talking about the saints since the beginning of the church? The saints and the canonization of saints and those people who are, and for the record, saints, well, there's two different types of saints. There's the, the Bible talks about saints and those are just followers of Christ, Christians, people who follow Christ. Those are saints, the generic term, and the Catholic Church uses that term as well. What we're talking about here, capital S saints, are canonized saints, meaning we know for certain that these people are in heaven. And Jesus said, if you lay down your life for me, you know, I will raise it up again on the last day. Meaning if you give up a grain of wheat that dies, you know, it shall find life. So if you die for Christ, you automatically have eternal life. So from the earliest days, martyrs, which were galore, by the way. I mean, the earliest Christians were being martyred by the hundreds and thousands sometimes. So the earliest Christians were saying they are going to heaven. They're in heaven now. We can ask for their prayers. They're saints. They're with Christ. So from the earliest days, we've seen these people as saints. However, you know, sometimes people were saying uh, this person's a saint or that person's a saint, and there wasn't a lot of good information or possibly credible uh, facts attached to these stories. Many might have been given to legend. So what the Catholic Church did in 995 was to create the canonization process, or really to make it more strict, making it like more scientifically verifiable, strict, to go by it, to ma basically make it scientific. And that means you have to have miracles. You have to have these confirmations. We have to look at the writings of the saints. We have to make sure their lives are holy in order to say for a fact that these people are in heaven. They have to meet this criteria. So it's not that we invented saints in 995. We believed in saints since the earliest days of Christianity. But what did come about is the canonization process with kind of a strict rigor attached to it. The next one we're going to talk about, and this is going to be the last one for this video, and we'll do more in part two, but it says in 1074, mandatory priestly celibacy was enacted. 1074. <sighs> there are many, many, many errors and 
overgeneralized and poorly presented arguments just in this one statement. I mean, it, it shows a whole host of misunderstandings of the topic. They just attach themselves to one thing that might have happened in history and say, oh, the Catholic Church invented it. Jesus' church started in 1054. This started in 1074. Therefore, this is a false doctrine, and we can safely ignore the Catholic Church, but they won't apply the same logic to Protestantism and the Bible alone, which was never heard of until the 1400s, faith alone, which was never heard of until the 1400s, the rapture, which was never heard of until the 1600s, not popularized till the 1700s, and so many more that I could match. Oh, no, those are fine. Those are biblical, except that nobody in 1,700 years interpreted the Bible that way. No one in 1,400 years interpreted the Bible that way. Oh, well, you know, they just had to reform what was happening. They make all these excuses. They have all these double standards. They do these mental gymnastics, and they don't hold themselves to those same standards. The Bible alone was invented far later than any of these that they've that we've mentioned so far. And this mandatory celibacy for priests, priestly celibacy, that goes back to the early church. In fact, it was started in the 300s in part, and in the 400s is made, you know, a lot more universal in the Roman Rite. We kind of have to step back first of all. I mean, there's a few points that need to be hit made here. First of all, there's 23 rites in the Catholic Church. Only in the Roman Rite priests can't get married. And that's not even a hard, fast rule. Like, if you're a Protestant pastor who's already married, and you come into the Catholic Church and want to be a priest, there are Catholic priests who are married for certain reasons that happened before they became Catholic. Um, also, in the 22 other rites, the Eastern rites of the Catholic Church, all priests can marry. So this prohibition is only for the Roman Rite. It's not for the whole Catholic Church. And any priest in the Eastern Rite can marry, and I know many married priests. Second, from the most ancient times of Christianity, celibacy, even priestly celibacy, even virginity was practiced by Catholics from the earliest days of Christianity. I mean, this we'll, we'll come back to this in a second, but it comes from the exhortation of Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, and Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, to those people they were exhorting who serve the kingdom of God. It is better to stay celibate in order to serve God and his kingdom. We'll come back to that in a second. So priestly celibacy has firmly been in place since at least the 400s. Uh, and that's like six or so, seven centuries before <laughs> they're claiming that it was actually made. So it goes back long before 1074. What happened in 1074? Well, a lot of priests weren't living chastely. They were living immoral lives, and the church needed to be reformed. And one of the popes that came to power, Pope Gregory, decided to reform that aspect. And he cracked down on that severely and demanded that priests live celibate lives and stop living unchastely. Then, about I think it was about 10 years later, he did it for bishops, too, and he had major uh, ecclesiastical canonical penalties for bishops and others who would not enforce this law. So it's not that it was invented in 1074. It was already in practice, just some weren't living it. And so they kind of restarted up the engine again to get it going to make sure everyone was on the same page. Everyone was living celibate, had nothing to do with marriage or rejecting marriage in this uh, in, in the Pope's mind, in the Church's mind at this time. It had to do with combating the problem of immorality among some priests, many priests, in fact. It had nothing to do with marriage. In fact, if the, the, the final prohibition, like the, the canonized at a council prohibition, actually came much later at the council, uh, the Second Lateran Council in 1139. That's, I mean, that's when it was officially proclaimed at a council for all future priests going forward. So, <laughs> I mean, either way, 1074 isn't right in any date before or after, I mean, because it was before and after, depending on how you're looking at the, the whole thing. But 1074 has nothing to do with inventing priestly celibacy or mandating it at that time. It's just not accurate to the facts since it was around long, long, long centuries before that. I would add to this that many anti-Catholics would say that the Catholic Church forbids to marry, and you're just wrong to do that. Bible says you can't forbid marriage. And this isn't forbidding marriage. The Catholic Church does not forbid marriage. <laughs> Any adult Catholic 
who wants to get married can get married. We're not forbidding marriage. Anybody can get married. I asked one person once if uh, he wanted to get married and have kids. He's like, oh, gosh, no, 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 never. I No, 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 no. I said, what do you want to do? He's like, I want to become a Catholic priest. He wanted to become a priest. He wanted to give his life for God. He didn't want to get married. First of all, there's no mandatory uh, ecclesiastical doctrine in Christianity saying we have to be married. No one has to be married unless you're a Mormon and you want to get to the highest heaven, then you have to be married. But for Christians, we don't have to be married. We can be single. We can be going into the priesthood. There's no prohibition for that. There's no prohibition against being celibate. You can be celibate or you can be married. It's your choice. If you want to be married, go for it. If you want to be a priest, go for it. Nobody is restricting you. If you want to be a priest, though, that's your choice. It's a free will choice. It's not marriage being forbidden to you because you can freely choose to get married if you want to. And we're following the advice of Jesus in Matthew 19, 12 and 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul and Jesus exhort people to be celibate. They encourage it as a higher calling, as like the one that should be preferred for those who are serving the kingdom of God. And so that's why the Catholic Church does that, so that we can do it single-mindedly. And you can look at the divorce rates of Protestant pastors. The, the, the well-known fact of the problem children that problem pastors have. And if you watch Protestant made movies, you can even see the well-known joke that the pastor's kid's the troubled kid, the one who's doing the things he's not supposed to. Even Catholic priests in the Eastern Rites, I've talked to them, they say it's very, very difficult to have a full-time job serving God and serving your family too. It's very difficult. Usually one gets neglected. And what the Catholic Church wanted to do is make sure that n neither got neglected and serve one or the other. And if you're going to serve God, go all the way. Um, but again, that's not all Catholics. The Eastern Rite Catholics can still marry, so there's no complete ban. There's never been a complete ban in the Catholic Church against marriage. Married priesthood, that is, by the way. Mar <laughs> no complete ban against a, a married priesthood, because some still can get married. But the bottom line is, priestly celibacy was here from the beginning of the church, like from, probably from the 3rd or 4th century. I mean, even before that, people started doing it voluntarily. But around the 3rd and 4th century, the Catholic Church started discussing it and following the advice of Jesus and Paul. But the bottom line is, none of these things so far have been true. And as we're going to see in part 2, they're still not going to be true. Just because people say things against the Catholic Church doesn't mean they're true. And this is for all those people who have left the Catholic Church, all the ex-Catholics, former Catholics, many of them who did not research these before they were duped, before they were lied to, and before they were led astray. Others have researched them and thankfully stayed in the Catholic Church because they realized they weren't true. But many people left without first researching these things to see if they're true. Maybe you're thinking about leaving the church now. You can see that these things aren't true, and we have so many videos showing these that will help build up your faith if you're interested. Check out our Catholic Truth playlist, our Apologetics folder playlist. And if you would like us to come to your parish to give a retreat, apologetic seminars, uh, Newman Centers, anything else, please check out our website, catholictruth.org. And if you would like to support our ministry, please consider supporting our ministry. These videos take forever to make, especially the long and depth ones, like the one coming Sunday, like John MacArthur. It literally takes like six or seven hundred dollars or more sometimes just to make one video because so much research goes into it. So much cataloging of exact facts it takes so many countless hours, plus the pre-edits, plus the editing of the video, plus post-production, plus all... SEO, keyword research, all of this stuff takes a monumental amount of time. And our, our videos take between about $300 to $1,000 each. So we need a lot of donors to donate $50, $100, $25, anything that you can afford to help support this ministry so we can keep pumping out these videos and keep saving souls, keep changing lives, keep bringing people back to the church. And thanks be to God, we're bringing a ton of people back to the Catholic Church, a ton of people all different denominations, atheists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and more because of our patrons who help us to do the work that we do. So thank you. If you would like to follow us on social media, you can see that down below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave it in the comment section. And please like and share. And if you're new here, make sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching and God bless you.